suffered a hit which started a fire in the four-inch battery. The fire spread with alarming speed. I was, as Flag Lieutenant Smith, my, my position was with, with the command. And the Admiral had decided that he was going to conduct the battle from the compass platform rather than the Admiral's Bridge. So although the captain was fighting the ship from the compass platform, the Admiral was controlling the, 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 the battle from there. The Admiral was sitting in the captain's chair at the, in the front of the compass platform. The captain was standing close behind him. The squadron gunnery officer was on the wing of the bridge at the compass platform. Navigating officer with the officer watch by the Polaris and the other midshipman of the watch who is uh, Bill Dundas standing by the phones and the voice pipes on the port side. So I was in a position to see everything that was going on and to hear everything that was going on. And I kept pestering the flag lieutenant, you know, what's the, and he was very helpful. He was telling me what, 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 what was happening. The Admiral's intentions were that once action had been joined, that Hood and Prince of Wales should take on Bismarck, and that the two cruisers, Norfolk and Suffolk, and the Rear Admiral Wake Walker, should be brought up to, to take on the Prince Eugen, and that the six destroyers that we'd had to leave behind, which were 50 miles behind, should be brought up to carry out torpedo attacks as necessary. But things happened with such bewildering rapidity when the action took place. I mean, from the time that we opened fire to the time that Hood was fatally hit was, was about five minutes, and she went down in less than three from the time that she was hit until she disappeared. At six o'clock, or slightly before six o'clock in the morning, it was cloudy, clear, and there was a heavy swell and we sighted the two ships and we closed the range to 25,000 yards 12 and a half miles uh, before we opened fire we'd been at action station from 10 o'clock the previous night the whole trip on the upper deck of course it was cold so uh, for example I was wearing um, the long johns vest um, sweater overalls, trousers, overcoat, duffel coat, oilskin. We wear an anti-flash gear, tin hats, gas mask, gloves, anything to keep us warm. Because we'd been at action stations when the hood was sunk for over eight hours. And it was cold. And then approximately six o'clock, we opened fire with A and B turrets. The Prince of Wales followed, and then we had return fire from the Bismarck and Prince Eugen. 
We could see the topmast of the Bismarck, so you could see, you know, uh, the part of the hull, the funnels and masts and etc. And we could see flashes as they as their guns fired. We sighted her uh, just after five at, at a range of 20 miles and that was very fine on the starboard bow. Just the, two, the spotting tops of the, of the two ships. We got in to about uh, the 12 mile range and we then opened fire. Again, fine on the starboard bow, and consequently the after guns could not be brought into action. They couldn't bear f for sufficiently far enough for it. So we could only use the forward gun turrets. Prince of Wales was on our starboard quarter, and she could also only use her forward gun turrets. We'd fired about six salvos, I suppose, before Bismarck replied. She'd obviously been taken completely by surprise. Because although she realised that there were two heavy cruisers in the, uh, uh, shadowing her, she had no idea that there were two capital ships in the vicinity because of the radio silence that we'd been keeping. Oh, we also made the, made the mistake then of assuming that Bismarck was the leading ship. We could only see the spotting tops originally. In actual fact, the leading ship was the Prince Eugen. Uh, so we had to shift target as soon as the mistake was realised. We hit Bismarck, I think it was with the third salvo, and that hit one of her oil tanks and caused a leak in one of those oil tanks, which I think subsequently led to her rediscovery after, uh, after the action. We, I say, we'd fired about six salvos before she replied. Now, her gunnery was extremely accurate. Now, what struck me at that time was the, the unreality of it. It, it, seemed as, it. it just seemed as if it just wasn't happening. Yes, it, the, the calmness was there. It, 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 it just seemed as if you were watching a film. It wasn't, it wasn't part of it. The, other, the remaining ships, those below decks, etc., were, kept, were given a running commentary on what was going on by the Padre over the, over the, over the intercom. So they would be getting a, a, a picture, but not as clear a picture as we on the, on the, on the compass platform did. It was a very calm, matter-of-fact, uh, running commentary effort. Uh, we have just sighted the two topmasts of the, uh, of the enemy, uh, enemy ships. We are turning towards to intercept and we would be opening fire in, the, in, in very shortly and, and that type of thing. She has been hit and then that hit, that sound you heard was Hood being hit on the, at the base of the mainmast. And it was a steady running commentary of, of that, that, that type of thing. Well, at this time I was on the upper deck guns cruise. I was on the anti-aircraft guns. So we were of no use whatever at this time. There were no aircraft about. That is why they sent most of them into the, or ordered us to go into the shelter deck, uh, so they would be clear of any uh, flying shrapnel. The first shells were over, but in our wake. I think they fired two or three. The third shell hit us on the upper deck, and started a fire near one of the ammi open ammunition uh, uh, we had ammunition stores where you had ready use ammunition stores most of the upper deck guns crews thinking back to what had happened at Iran had been ordered to go forward into a space below the bridge where the dentist uh, chapel and everything was 
as soon as the ammunition started to explode, the radius ammunition, uh, the gunner's mate, Miss Bishop, came and said to three of us who were not, who hadn't gone for it, uh, to put the fire out. And we said, wait until the ammunition stopped exploding. He said, I'll go in and tell the officer of the quarters. And he went in the space. This, uh, and the next shells came inboard right in there and at the same time blew the aloft director away. At this time, the three of us were laying down next to a, what we, a UP. Uh, it's a, it was a funny thing that fired rockets and it had an anti-blast shield around it, which was semicircular, because the half of it was at the sea. Uh, very much like a, an express train going through a, through a tunnel type, type thing. Okay. okay. Um, that's the that's best way I think of dis describing it. Was this a terrifying noise? Yes. Yes, it was. Uh, I hesitate because, it, yes, it was, it was a terrifying noise, but you got the, I uh, said before, uh, uh, it was a feeling of unreality. It just, just it didn't seem to be taking place. It's not happening to me. It can't be happening. And I, I think, really, that was where all your, all your basic training came, came into being, that you did your uh, reactions automatically, without thinking. The Bis Bismarck's third salvo went over, the next salvo fell short, and the fifth salvo hit us. And that hit at the base of the mainmast. I was on the compass platform with it with the Admiral, uh, so I, I knew exactly what, what was going on. But we couldn't see half because of the enclosed, uh, enclosed bridge. All we knew was we'd been hit because the ship shuddered and we were thrown off our feet, etc. The gunnery commander, com Commander Gregson, went out onto the starboard wing of the, uh, of the bridge and came back and reported to the captain that there was a hit at the base of the mainmast and there was a fire around the four-inch ready-use lockers there. These were the secondary armament, the actual uh, ready-use lockers, and the exploding ammunition going up there. And the captain re ordered that that fire be left until all the ready-use ammunition had exploded and that the boat deck should be cleared of all unwounded personnel until such times as it had it, it all gone by. Suddenly, disaster. The hood was rent in twain by a mighty explosion. A few minutes after, she vanishes beneath the waves amidst a vast pall of smoke. By that time, we got into the range that we wanted to get into. And the Admiral ordered both ships to alter course to bring the after guns into action. And it was just as we were altering course that the next salvo hit us. And that virtually penetrated down into X and Y magazines, the two after magazines. I personally didn't hear any explosion at all. Again, the ship shuddered and we were all thrown off our feet. And all I saw was a gigantic sheet of flame which shot round the front of the compass platform. It was, a, it was a very, very calm atmosphere, apart from after, after the hit you, you heard the screams and the noise of, of the carnage that was going on, and that, that, that caused quite a, quite a little bit of apprehension. Between the shell which sank us and the penultimate shell, we had started turning to port to bring the X and Y turrets into action. Uh, basically, you want all your guns firing at your enemy, you don't just want half your um, batteries firing. I 
often thought that it was a mistake of the Admiral, but I found out later, through reading various books, that he knew about the um, the upper deck not being as strengthened, not being as strong as armour pierce uh, against armour piercing shells as it should have been, and he therefore had to get in close and sink her before she sank us. Um, and then we were hit. And the whole ship, there was a terrific explosion, and the whole ship suddenly dead silence. I've never heard nothing at all before like this. I don't know whether maybe I've been deaf to her. But apparently the brass the blast, I was nearest to the UP, the blast must have come round, missed me, he killed the petty officer, and the AB line next to him had his side cut open, looked as if a butcher had got in when all his innards were coming out, and I thought, oh, I'm going to be sick. And I got up and went to the ship's side, and noticed that the water was much closer than it was, and the bows were coming out of the water. So I went to the forward end of the boat deck, dropped under the forecastle. I realised the ship was sinking, obviously. She was rolling over and the bow was coming out. And stripped off my tin hat, dandy flash gear, overcoats. By then, the sea had reached me and I was in the water. I got to my feet and the ship had started listing to starboard. And she'd gone about 10 degrees, I suppose when she righted herself and started going on to, over to port and she carried on going over. At the same time, I heard the quartermaster report at the voice back, steering gear gone, sir. And the captain ordered change over to emergency conning. And by that time she was going over and we realised that she just wasn't coming back. Bill Dundas, he was uh, being on the coast left, as I say, and he made his way out. He kicked out one of the armour-plated windows of the, of the uh, uh, forward part of the compass platform. How on earth he managed to do it, God alone knows. And he sprayed his ankle in doing so, and he went out that way. Bob Tilburn had the most miraculous escape of the lot. He was on the boat deck, and he went over on the port side, where she was going over. And one of the roof aerials which had, which had broken, tangled around his legs underwater and he had to take his knife out and cut himself free underwater. And he'd got a small wound in his knee. The only thing that was wrong with me is I'd, I'd swallowed some oil. We were in P3 in the Prince of Wales. On the, the port side, we were on what we call the, the disengaged side. And we just got in and closed down all the hatches and that sort of thing. And the 525s, in fact, opened fire first. But in, I went down into the working chamber, uh, and in fact, the chamber where the shells come up from the shell room and the magazines before going into the working chamber. And I walked around the working chamber and looked out through uh, a little, they had an aperture where one threw spent cases over the sea if they should jam up in the tower. And I looked towards the hood and could do this and we started. In the first rounds from Bismarck seemed in fact to come, I thought, rather nearer us than to the hood. But then the next one seemed to come around the hood and then a fire started on the boat deck of the hood. And then quite frankly I can't, it, it is, the more I think of it, I thought of this in ever since this I could hear no bang no sound whatever. There was just a, and I don't know if you've seen the barm blown up on the North Africa, the, the explosion of the barm when she was torpedoed. But there's something akin to that. There's a great, like a glow and a mass of smoke. And the bows came out, and as it came out, the forward, uh, two of the forward guns seemed to fire the hood, and that was it. The, 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 the folks all went round into the sea. And there was quite a gale blowing, 
and it was quite soon when the smoke cleared above the sea and you could just see the wash and there was nothing there and there was that sudden feeling of the shock was I, I just it was you know unbelievable here I am being brought up in as an apprentice from 16 in the might of the Royal Navy in the hood had always been the epitome of all that was great in the British Navy and there it was gone nothing and I walked back then around the work, working chamber out into this uh, hoist space the uh, machinery space and leaned on a, an air bottle which we use for blowing fumes out through the guns when we fire in the turret otherwise fumes of course cordite fumes would uh, impair the guns crew and I leaned on this bottle instantly it had four thousand pounds per square inch of air in there and I was there with the an LTO a leading torpedo uh, operator and the second captain of the turret a leading seaman but uh, we were we were a guy couldn't believe this at all 